Hi, I'm Eric Hall, the Digital Sports Editor at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and I'm joined by Paul Bowker, who was the APSC president in 1996-97, while sports editor at the Florida Times Union in Jacksonville, Florida, and then the Cedar Rapids, Iowa Gazette. Thanks for joining me, Paul. I'm doing great. How are you, how are you doing today, Eric? This it's, is awesome. it's a little warm today, but I'm getting <laughs> by. <laughs> well, I, I was out walking and running yesterday, and the heat index was 109, and I imagine that you're even a little bit higher than that. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you get involved with APSC? Um, I was um, – um, Copy. I came out of KU, University of Kansas, and I was at the Kansas City Star as a copy editor and also a reporter. And I decided to take my first sports editor job at the Wilkes-Barre Times Leader in Pennsylvania. It was at that time part of Cap Cities, just like Kansas City was. Um, and I had the opportunity my first year there uh, to go to an APSC convention. I had known about APSC because of Kansas City and Dale By was the sports editor there, became very involved in APSC. Um, so I went to uh, my first convention was in Santa Monica, California, and um, I loved it. I learned I learned a lot at the Kansas City Star and at KU, but I learned a tremendous amount of things through the workshop in Santa Monica. And that was just kind of the big turn on for me to Santa Monica, and it was uh, it was really awesome. You not only did get to meet to all these people and go to all these workshops, but I still remember the banquet because it was in Santa Monica. Uh, the banquet at Santa Monica, every single table had some sort of a Hollywood celebrity or a Hollywood sports figure. So it's like, so it's the first time sports editor. It was like, wow, this is really really cool. <laughs> And so that's kind of how I went into APSC. And um, from there, you know, I just got more and more and more involved in the organization as the years went on. Yeah, I've heard uh, some of the celebrities there were Howie Mandel and Delta Burke. Do you remember who was at your table? I It was Wes Parker, actually, for, for, from, from the LA Dodgers. It was the... Uh, the awards presentation were actually kind of funny because I can't remember her name, but the little girl from Archie Bunker's place on uh, All in the Family was giving out the awards. And she thought it was kind of this Hollywood thing. So we we would have these sports editors go up to accept the plaque at the front of the uh, front of the room. And she was like hugging everybody and congratulations, giving them a kiss on the cheek. It was like, whoa. <laughs> But, I, but um, it, it, it was really, really uh, a, a terrific convention, you know, that the LA Times and Bill Dwyer put on there. And, it, it, and for me, for a new guy, um, it, it was just a total turn on to APSC, you know, not because of the uh, banquet, but really because of the workshops and all, all of the uh, professional learning that was going on for four days. How did you go from your first conference there in Santa Monica to eventually moving into leadership of the organization? Um, I just got more and more involved in the APSC over the years. And as I took on other sports editor jobs, you know, they were always looking for people at that time. Uh, we did have a print newsletter that went out, um, I believe was, I think we did like five or six or maybe even seven of those every year. So they're always looking for people to get involved with a newsletter. So I did that. Um, I got involved as an APSC liaison. I think it was with track and field. Every single sport, uh, you know, that we have in the U.S., we tried to get an APSC liaison, you know, to kind of keep an eye and help with the writing committees for all of those sports. So, you know, so I did track and field. And it's like, as soon as you do one thing for APSC, there's like three or four other things that pop up. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I just loved it. I, I thought it was terrific. And, and I learned a lot of things going along the way. And pretty soon, um, we came, the fourth, I was the first fourth VP in history, which I don't think we have anymore. I think now it's third VP, but um, 
when that position came up it was specifically for small newspaper sports errors and, and my name was kind of at the top of the list that at that time because I was so involved and and for for me it was a terrific terrific opportunity and that's kind of how I got into the leadership role the once you were president that first year you were president was kind of a busy year for you the first month of your presidency you're also uh covering the Atlanta Olympics and leading coverage for that <laughs> uh how was it how was that um, it, it was a really uh, exciting time in my life because I had just gotten married in 1993. Um, the Olympics in Atlanta, um, I, was, I was the Olympics editor for the Florida Times Union in Jacksonville, but we belonged at the time to a large, a fairly large uh, newspaper group called Morris Communications, which was based out of Augusta, Georgia. And so I went to Atlanta as the assistant bureau chief for the Olympics. And, and we, I mean, we, we rented space, at, you know, at the media center in Atlanta. Um, so we were, we were doing a lot. We were, we were outputting um, not only you know, tons of stories every day, but we were actually also producing pages so that we could get them to the member newspapers. So that was a really exciting time. I took the job in Jacksonville to be the first editor to oversee the Jacksonville Jaguars expansion year. Um, so I love to be a busy guy. I, I love doing big time stuff like that. So to have the first year of the Jaguars, the NFL in Jacksonville where you know, we were doing special sections every time somebody sneezed at the stadium, I think. We were doing special sections every other week. Um, and then you follow that up with the Olympics. And then, oh, you know, all of a sudden your wife gets a job up in Cedar Rapids. So now, and she is pregnant with our only child, our first child. And so there, yeah, there are a lot of things happening. <laughs> De definitely a lot of things happening at that time. <laughs> How did you balance being a PSE president, taking over at Cedar Rapids and leading things there and becoming a dad for the first time? The the busiest time for APSC, and I think anybody who's in that position will tell you when you are the uh, when you're in the incoming president, you are the coordinator for that convention. Um, and I was in Jacksonville at the time. I hadn't quite made the move to Cedar Rapids. So I, so I can tell you, uh, it's fortunate that really I was at a big paper. There are a lot of responsibilities there, but it's a big paper. Um, so there's, so there's a lot of support, you know, that's, that's really kind of surrounding you. But I, I can tell you, I began every single day, um, uh, dealing with APSE and convention things. There are, there are a lot of calls to make. There are a lot of things you had to follow up. You know, you're not only trying to get your program going, and I had over 30 workshops. That's a heck of a lot of speakers. You, you know, you get have to try to line up. But there's also uh, a lot of coordination that has to be done with the host city, which happened to be Cleveland, the host hotel. Roy Hewitt, who's the plain dealer, was just unbelievable because he wanted to do a really good convention. And, um, but, you know, you just start your day every day. That way, I mean, you, you're going to spend an hour or two. Hopefully, that's not game day. <laughs> But, you know, you're going to spend an hour or two on the phone and, and just making sure that every I is dotted and, and just uh, it really tests your organization skills to be able to do something like like that. When you're president, uh, and a lot of that is because Ed Storen was in place, it, it president, everything just kind of, there's so much support in APSC, everything just kind of falls in line. Uh, the big thing during my presidency was having to go to the NCAA because they were threatening to withhold all credentials for our members uh, to the NCAA basketball tournament because the gambling issue came up. Paul Anger had also dealt with this, but they were threatened to withhold every single basketball credential to our members, so we had to go to the NCAA. Uh, Dave Smith, bless his heart. From the Dal from Dallas came up with two of his lawyers, 
Um, Tim Ellerby, who was at that time, at the time, Spicky in New Orleans, he, he went up there with me. So that was kind of the big issue. But like as a president, um, there are a lot of days you can take a breath of fresh air, but because you don't have to be doing the convention, you have to make sure that the person that the next person along is taking care of business there. But um, the the presidential year can can kind depending on what's going on in terms of issues. But the president year can actually after the previous because I was a national officer for five years. You can actually take a breath of relief as, as a president because there's so much support in the organization. I think that there still is. There's so much support in the organization that everything just kind of falls into place for you. So how did things go with that meeting with the NCAA that you talked about that included Dave Smith and Tim Ellerby? It was uh, stressful and it was intense. From the, from the first moment that we show up, this was in Kansas City when they had their headquarters in Kansas City. Uh, from the first time you show up at the NCAA office um, and you have to be escorted up to this room because it's one of those elevators where they need a special key to get to, to, get to the executive floor. And it was, it was very, very intense. And uh, when we went to the room with this large, uh, large conference table, um, looked like the conference table on Christmas vacation, <laughs> or, or maybe Putin's conference table, but um, all of our people got on one side of the conference table and the NCAA, the executive director and the president and a whole army of lawyers that they had on their side got on the other side of the table. And so, so we had this thing that we had to overcome. The NCAA didn't want gambling ads in newspapers, which of course we don't control. Um, and we, we don't want this to get, and it's, from ethical reasons, we don't want this to get in the way of people not getting passes to the NCAA basketball tournament. They knew that the NCAA basketball tournament was the one thing that they could hold over our heads. So we just kind of came to some sort of agreement. Um, but it was, it was, you know, it took hours and hours. It was, the NCAA had backed us up into a corner and they just didn't want to give up. And, and so we just kind of had to reach a compromise and um, but it it, it, it it was intense. Everybody got to go to the tournament. We didn't have any problems after that. So that that was the good part of it. The uh, the Basketball Writers Association also was involved there. They, they had their presence at that meeting as well. But it was uh, for being president of APSC, it's like, whoa. Were you satisfied with the compromise? Um, I was satisfied with the compromise, but um, looking back now, um, I think, and, and I'm talking about myself, I think I caved a little bit more than I should have because the compromise, which allowed the NCAA to just kind of crawl out of the hole a little bit, the compromise was I, as APSC president, was supposed to send a letter uh, to all of our member organizations, which I did, um, just saying that we don't support, um, we, we know what an issue gambling is, and of course it'd be a joke in 2023, but we know, you know, we, cause every, it's everywhere now, but we know what a problem gambling is. And it, it was just a very loosely worded letter that we sent to all of our members. And if I had to do it again, I, I think uh, we had to find some way to get over this hump, to get over this obstacle. And, and, uh, and it wasn't, it was my final decision, but you know, we, we talked with the attorney, with our attorneys there and Tim talked and Dave talked. And so, so we just kind of decided to do this, but um, 
you know, I, I think maybe we should have held our line a little a little bit more. That that day, you're just trying to get over the obstacle. Let's get this done. Let's make sure that we don't have any issues with the NCAA basketball tournament. But I would say in 2023, that was, you know, quite a while ago. I, I would say, you know, let's kind of hold the line on this. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about the conference in Cleveland in 1996 that you were involved with putting on. What was your approach to organizing that? My whole approach, uh, I started my career at the Kansas City Star, but I spent a lot of my career as a sports editor in medium-sized papers and small papers. It was very important to me, uh, especially after discussion with a lot of those editors, that we have a lot of workshops. That was really, at that time, and I'm sure it is now, the workshops that we held at the convention were the lifeblood of the organization, especially in terms of members. The big paper members wanted to win contests and wanted to be involved with the APSC and get into issues like the NCAA and, and all, the, all the commissioners of the professional sports leagues and the Olympics committee that we had that helped to decide uh, credentials, uh, you know, to the Olympics thing, games, especially with it, Layer 96, because it was here. Um, but a lot of the small paper sports areas, they don't really get an opportunity to get involved in that. And so for them, the most important thing that APSC could do was these workshops. And we tried to do a lot of workshops in Cleveland. I think we had over 30 of them. Uh, that's a lot of speakers to line up. But I know that for the small paper sports, there's a lot of these people are coming to Cleveland and going to conventions on their own dime. A lot of them don't even get vacation. They don't even get the time off. They don't get that support uh, you know, from their newspaper companies that they should have. So a lot of them are coming on their own dime and, and they're doing it so they can meet people and so that they can learn something. And, and a lot of that comes from my first lesson in Santa Monica because I was just blown away. Uh, we, we even had, in Santa Monica, we even had uh, like, like a workshop session on how to crop photos. Um, and when you're at your job, whoever walks in and, and teaches you how to crop photos. Now the chief photographer might walk in and say they don't like the way you did something the day before or something, but um, but um, that was the small paper editors. That was really the lifeblood of the organization. The, the hospitality rooms that we had at night at the conventions were just filled uh, with these small paper sports editors who brought their papers to the convention and they wanted to get other people to look at the papers and do critiques. Um, so that that was really important to me. And, and, and I know that's something that, you know, we, we were actually able to pull off in Cleveland. We really had a, a lot, a lot of workshops there. Um, you talked about the the agreement you made with the NCAA. Were there any other big challenges you faced during your presidency or time in leadership at APSC? The big challenge, I think, in, in terms of my presidential year, um, the big challenge was we weren't quite there yet, but APSC was an all-newspaper um, organization at that point. We weren't letting people from websites in. We weren't letting the electronic media in, but clearly there was this wave that clearly this was going to have to happen at one point. So my president year was kind of in the middle of a transitionary period for the organization because it's like we knew this thing was coming down the pipe. In fact, we had many members, Jim Jenks was one of them, we had many members who went over to that side and then, well, we don't really want to lose Jim from the organization, you know, what, what are we going to do here? Um, and, and so my present year, nothing got done during that year, nothing got done in the immediate years after, but 
but I, I think really the 1990s is when this transitionary period began for APSC. So it's kind of all on our minds. You know, at some point we're going to have to open up the membership to things beyond newspapers, which eventually happened. But I think in the 1990s, it was, it was a big transitionary period there. Um, and, you know, the other thing was the Olympics. You know, 19, I came a year after that as far as my president year, but the Olympics were a big issue too because we had a lot of members who wanted to get credentials into the Olympic Games in, in Atlanta, and not everybody was going to get them. And, um, so, so I know, maybe not for the big newspapers, because I've worked at big newspapers, and if you don't apply for a credential, you actually have people calling you up, hey, you're going to go to the World Cup or not? So, so they actually call you up. But when you're a medium-sized paper, a small paper, that really doesn't happen. And so a lot of the issues, people knew they had my ear. So a lot of the issues for like the small newspapers, especially, happened to be credentials. And not just for the Olympics, but people who are locked out of maybe Major League Baseball or locked out of uh, college basketball, college football, a bowl game, something like that. I think I lost you. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Um, so credentials, uh, credentials be, became a big issue during my year, but, but credentials always, they, I don't know if they are now or not, but I know credentials were the big issue during a lot of other years too, because if somebody can't get a credential to an NFL game, I, I would try to help out there. And that's what all of our, uh, commission, uh, committees were about too. Gotcha. Um, how how did you uh, try to resolve the the issues with the Olympic credentials there? Well, the great thing with the Olympic credentials, and I forget when the when our Olympics committee would set up, it would have been prior to my year, but I I got on the committee myself. Roy Hewlett really did a lot with that, but we, uh, you know. The U.S. Olympic Committee, Team USA, uh, they were very encouraging to have APSC get involved in the credential uh, process because they felt uh, they felt that APSC could step in and make some of those decisions. Um, if one big paper was asking for too many credentials, then the AP then an APSC committee could say, well instead of 10 can you do with eight because we could take those two spots and give them and give one to this paper and one to that paper so so a lot of it was uh the usoc loved having apsc involved because we could kind of police ourselves a little bit um and and so a lot of people joined the uh you know, the APSC Olympics credential committee. And, and so in those two years prior to Olympic Games, um, we, we provided a great service to the USOC because now the USOC wasn't the bad guy anymore. APSC actually was because we were trying to police ourselves. And uh, that, that, became a, that became a really, really good thing. Is there anything else you're particularly proud of uh, from your time time as president or in, or in leadership of the organization? Um, I'm really proud of what it, what I was able to do for small papers, um, not just the president year, but all of the years leading up to that. Um, being the first fourth VP in history, um, I was setting the stage for. for for anything that was going to happen behind me. So it was very important uh, th that, that I did a really good job in that role, and, and, and I did. And that's why um, I just, you know, at the end of your fourth VP year, which was just one year, at the end of that, um, you can either decide to run for president, you know, to get, to get into the uh, 
you know, the natural, the, the way first, second, third work back then, you can either get into the election for that or decline. Um, and several of them following up on me declined because they just, they didn't have the time for it. Um, I worked at a medium-sized paper, large-sized paper at the time, so I decided I wanted to make time for it and could. Uh, but that's the most important thing to me, Eric, is uh, being the first fourth VP in history. I uh, don't want to sound like Larry Bird, but it's like, don't screw this up. You know, that was my job. Don't screw this up. Because if I do a crappy job as a fourth VP, guess what? It, they're not going to have another one. It will never happen again. Um, so, so that was really, really important to me, um, just to be able to fill that role the way that APSC had designed it, that we want to get small. That, that was always a dilemma. They wanted to get small. They wanted to get editors from small papers involved in the organization, and until that point, until they created the fourth VP, which I think now is third VP, they really didn't have that happening. Um, and, and so, as I look at my legacy, I mean, I mean, that's it. I was the first fourth VP in history. I was also the first small paper sports editor to ever become president of the organization. That's my legacy, something I'm really, really proud of. Um, and, and, and I hope, and, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of small paper sports editors are still getting involved in the organization. And, and it has to happen because of what's happening uh, just to our industry. It's just been torn apart. Um, and, and it's so important uh, for people from from all sizes of organizations, whether they're newspapers or websites. It, it's so important for people to get involved. That's what's going to keep the ABSC going, and always has. Yeah, yeah. An issue we have now is that not many small papers have a sports editor. They might have sports writers, but they report to an editor of the news editor, or they report to a sports editor, another publication right i i'm one of them but i know uh not just sports editors but one of the best page designers and graphic designers in in the country uh charles apple he's lost his job three times i lost my job three times the last job i lost was i was sports editor at the cape cod times and gatehouse I've decided they didn't like my salary and they didn't need a sports editor anymore so they just whacked it and um, I, I know in New England, um, I was maybe the third, there are like two other larger papers, uh, sports editors, it, it larger papers that Gatehouse just whacked in it. It is just horrible. It's like, how can you do that? But they did. Yeah. Um, what has APSC meant to you professionally in your career? Uh, professionally, it has meant a lot. And I hate, boy, I really hate to use this as reason number one. Um, I wouldn't have gotten many of the good jobs I had without APSC. Uh, number one, APSC, because of the things we do in APSC, and we turn in all of our work for the contest, and, and we turn them in for a best ideas session every year that Tim Burke used to do. And so people would see our work. And what's the best recruiting tool when you're trying to find somebody? You see somebody's work, you see somebody getting involved. And so I can tell you that many of the great jobs that I had came through APSC because people saw my work. And so then they recruited me. A lot of the jobs I only had for a year and a half, two years, because I would go someplace, do, I think, a, a really good job. And then, so then somebody else would recruit me and want me at their paper, whether they were a sports editor, whether they were a publisher, whether they were the executive editor. Henry Freeman, who's one of the founders uh, of the organization, um, somebody, somebody I learned a great deal from, um, he recruited me to Wellington, to the, to the News Journal in the 1990s. And um, so APSC means a lot for that. It, it can do a lot of things for you professionally. 
Uh, but like I said, going all the way back for me personally to Santa Monica, that very first workshop to that very first day, uh, that professional development that you can get, especially now, newspapers don't do professional development anymore, even the big ones. APSC was where we all got our professional development. And then in the middle of that, you were also getting noticed because you're bringing your work in. And so you go, you go to the convention, go to these workshops, you learn a whole bunch of stuff. You go back to your paper and you integrate that into what you're doing on a daily basis. And then a year later, you're turning things into the contest or maybe bringing papers, uh, you know, to the conference. And all of a sudden, you know, you're doing good work now. You're doing work that was 10 times better than the year before. And when you compound that year after year after year, uh, that's that's what APSC has done for a whole bunch of people. Yeah. Uh, what what has the organization meant to you personally? Uh, per personally, it's that. Um, I also you know have a lot of friends who you know we're we're not face to face anymore because we're just kind of in different parts of the country and stuff but when i was diagnosed with cancer in 2021 um i i didn't go public with that for a while because it's just such a personal private thing um, but when I, when I went into treatment in January 2021, a lot of people showed up on Facebook, and I would, and anybody who's watching this now, I was just blown away by the support. And when you're going through chemo for seven months, um, you can't, especially in the middle of COVID, you can't go anywhere. You're just at home. Um, you go into the hospital every 21 days for a new treatment. I mean, we're seeing that now with Dick Patel. Um, you see it on Twitter every day. But that's all you have. You're home or you're in the hospital. And getting that sort of support just over Facebook meant just, it, I can't even put it into the words. It, it just means so much. A lot of people you haven't heard from years all of a sudden just show up. Um, you know, in, in a Facebook message or a Twitter message, and, and you, you just can't put any words on that. And the good news is everybody is, after seven months of treatment, all good, more than two years from remission now, and, and any anybody who is affected by that, I, I hope it goes the same way for them. But that meant a lot, especially because I've been out of APSC for so long that for 2021, everybody just to kind of show up and, and hey, Paul, I hope you're doing great and you'll get through this. And uh, that that amount of support uh, was, was great. I probably got more support from APSC than than any of the people I know personally at the different papers I worked at. That was that was terrific. I'm, I'm glad you received that kind of support and glad you're you're doing well now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. Um, I'm 69, just turned 69, and I refereed, I think, between 30 and 40 high school soccer games this spring. And so I'm, I'm a, I did nine. I went to a club soccer tournament one day, and they didn't have enough referees, so I just stayed there all day. I did nine games. So at the end of that, I'm just feeling like a beast. I'm like, bring it on. <laughs> That that sounds like a quite a grueling day. I did a little bit of high, uh, soccer officiating when I was in college, so like I can't. I'm not sure I'd be willing to try it now, but uh, I'm glad you're still doing it. <laughs> it's you know you know for a sports editor, you know a couple of high school soccer games at night. It's it's tough. You, you know you're out there and you're having to run a lot. You have to you know deal with coaches and fans and all that, but it's nothing compared to being a sports editor, it's, it's, uh, it's nothing. <laughs> um, what advice do you have for future presidents of APSC besides maybe being a, a soccer official? <laughs> be, be a soccer official. That way you can get used to people yelling at you. <laughs> um, the great thing about being APSC president, um, use the people around you. 
Um, and I think I did that, but I didn't do it enough. Um, use the people around you be, because they do want to help. And it, it's just like, it's just like being a top editor or a top executive someplace. Listen to the people around you. Um, use their advice. Use their expertise. You know, um, and, and enjoy it. You know, I still remember why. You know, things change when you're president because you're at the front of the room and everybody looks to you. And um, I, I still remember walking down the hallways um, at a convention and everybody says hi to you, everybody. Um, and you don't know who half of them are. You, you, you know the people that you're with all the time and that you've worked on committees with and maybe you did some contest judging with them and things like that. But the fact is, except for that one time during the year, twice, if you include judging, you you, ne you never see those people. Um, we're on the phone every once in a while, um, but you don't see those people. And so that's the really cool thing about APSC president is you're at the front of the room, everybody knows who you are, and, and you're just able to make a lot, you just walk down the corridor in a hotel and, and you, you're gonna make a lot of friends just that way. So my biggest advice is really, it's what we say at the beginning of a soccer game. When we have three officials out there, a lot of times the first, the last thing we say before we go to our positions is say, have fun. That's that's rule number one out here. Have fun. Make it safe and and let's do our job. But number one, let's have fun. And, and I think what that's what especially in these days, what we're having to go through, not only at newspapers, but on websites and everything. Um, have fun out there. Just have fun. What are you doing now in in your uh, in journalism capacities? My journalism capacity, um, when the Cape Cod taught, when Gatehouse decided they don't need sports editors anymore, I said, "I'm sorry." I said, "I'm not going down. I'm not going down this way. Um, I'll end my career." when I decide I want to end my career. I'm not going down this way. So, and it was fortunate. I took a job uh, at a small newspaper in Iowa, in Kelowna, Iowa. I still write for them now. I, I love it because I'm able to go to high school games and actually, in, instead of, uh, you know, being in the editing room all day and all night long, I'm actually able to have conversations with high school athletes and high school coaches and things so i so i really love it um i also covered some city council meetings i cover johnson county supervisors uh here in iowa city which is one of the biggest counties uh in the state um so i'm i'll tell you i'm really I'm really really enjoying doing things like that you know beyond that um that's what I'm doing locally. I have worked for Team USA as a writer and the editor since 2010. Um, the 1996 games just kind of made me love the Olympics ever, ever since then. Um, so, I've, so I write stories, uh, write you just find some wonderful stories. I'm, I'm doing a lot with Paralympic athletes lately, and my gosh, some of the things they go through. Uh, the story, I just did a story on a paracyclist who was a sniper in Iraq, um, and he, 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 was, he had serious head concussions because he was dropped out of a helicopter. He fell out of a helicopter um, and then they had IED blasts and, and just un unbelievable things there. But there are so many stories out there like that. But I've really enjoyed that. Um, I've been a national editor and a national writer uh, for the content that we provide for Team USA since 2010. And so I've really, really, really enjoyed that. I wish I got the only games I've been was 1996. And um, I work with Team USA almost every day, but we never go anywhere. It's all remote and it's all at home. 
Um, and I still remember when I was at the games in Atlanta, um, Bill Dwyer from the LA Times walked up to me and said, Paul, this isn't really the Olympics. This isn't what an Olympics is like. You have to go to a real Olympics someplace else, not not Atlanta. <laughs> this, this, this is like a big college football weekend. This isn't the Olympic Games. <laughs> So I, I I really enjoyed that, and um, I think, like I said, just just being able to write more than I ever really was able to write as an editor, I've, I've just really enjoyed that. And you've done a few books, if uh, if I'm correct. How how can people get those? They don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> they they might for their kids. I've, uh, this is through Redline Editorial up in Minneapolis, which is the same company I work for with Team USA and also with the USA Basketball. Um, we've published, I think, I've lost count. It's like 17 or 18 or 19 children's sports books. They're, uh, they're pretty cool to do, but anybody who has done a book, they know how much work it is. It's a lot of work. If you were actually figure out your hourly pay from something like that, it'd be like three cents an hour probably. It, it, it takes a lot of work to do one of those. But we're probably done 17, 18, 19 children's sports books. They're geared for the elementary schools. Um, and the reason I do it isn't for the little bit of money I get from it. I just hope um, this is just going to sound so weird, but um, I hope that by writing and publishing some of these children's sports books that wind up in the school libraries, that maybe that contributes like a tiny little bit to literacy among kids. Like when, the, when they're forced, when their assignment in elementary school is that they got to go read a book and do a book report on it, maybe, maybe just having a sports book on the shelf that's Patriots versus Jets rivalry or something like that. Maybe that's something because they love football that they want to pick up the book and read that book and do a book report on it. And maybe that helps with our literacy a little bit. And maybe, maybe when they get through high school, they want to pick up and read a newspaper. That that's a, sounds like a good reason to me to be writing those kind of books. <laughs> Well, is there anything else you want to add, Paul? Um, I've, I've really enjoyed this, Eric. In, in uh, APSC, uh, while I'm not really involved at this point, I, I still do a lot of uh, judging for some of the state contests. I think last year I did three state contests. So if you don't win, don't blame me. Um, so I, I still enjoy doing that kind of work. But um, APSC is still very dear, very close to my heart. I, I know a lot of the people there. I follow APSC. I see what's going on. Um, and, and all I can say is keep it going. It's really difficult in the uh, just what has happened to our industry and what has happened to our staffing. Um, and, and also with all the social media that has come up, it, it's really difficult to keep it going the way the way it is. But you know, we just gotta. It's. I'm sorry. I. I don't want to say it's like overcoming cancer, but it's like we just have to keep fighting. We have to keep the fight going. That sounds like a great motto and initiative uh, for us going forward. Thanks yeah. so much for your time, Paul. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate it, Eric.